Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.31, Seasoning Review, Part 1. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Season in Review. Much as I did following our first season, I plan to run this as a two-part episode. However, I admittedly was not a huge fan of the structure of our Season in Review last season, so this time I'm going to do things just a little bit differently. I felt that last season I spent far too much time trying to recap an entire season and that it became a bit more haphazard than I really wanted it to be. This took time away from what I wanted to do, which was to spend time trying to draw together some of the common links that we saw. Therefore, this season I'm going to spend the first part of the review, this part today, running through and giving a quick recap over some of the bigger events that we saw this season. This is going to, of course, be a very broad summary of what we've covered. This season was made up of 30 episodes, or about 15 hours worth of content. 15 hours of content simply cannot be boiled down into a 30-minute episode. So today is meant to just be a refresher of all the things we've covered instead of something more comprehensive. Of course, if you are new to the podcast and you're listening to this, I'm still going to strongly encourage you to go back and start at the very beginning. You don't get much more out of the show that way. Our next episode, I am going to spend our time actually trying to look at all the things that we have seen happen over the past 30 episodes and figure out what those common threads actually are. As we have seen this season, from essentially 1675 forward, the colonies have been in a near constant state of upheaval and strife. We are going to spend time looking at how all of those events are interrelated to each other and what the long-term ramifications will mean for the colonies in their future. If the first season of this podcast looked at the origins of the North American English colonies, the second season has been a study in the growing pains of those same colonies. And yes, we did look at a few of the colonies being founded. We corrected a mistake and went and spent an episode in Maryland, and likewise we saw the founding of Carolina, with a little help from a future superstar of the Age of Enlightenment, John Locke. However, while we spent time early in the season looking at new colonies, the real story of the season was the story of rebellion. It was a story of looking at the growing pains of the colonies as they moved through the latter part of the 17th century. Beginning our review in Virginia, we see that by the time the 1660s had rolled around, Virginia had become a leader in the European tobacco trade. No longer the colony that was wrecked with disease that we looked at during the first season, Virginia had moved towards a general stability as the death rate fell. Just prior to the restoration of the Stuarts, the colonists in Virginia elected William Berkeley as their governor. Berkeley had previously done a stint as the royal governor under Charles I. However, after Charles I was executed and the protectorate under Charles Cromwell took over, Berkeley was forced to step down. With the protectorate soon to be a thing of the past, Berkeley returned to a position of power and resumed his spot as the governor. Despite the seemingly more stable colony, when Berkeley retook control of it in 1660, Virginia was not without problems. Economically, the colony had become distressingly reliant on the tobacco trade. We have discussed multiple times throughout the run of the show the differences between the Virginia and the New England economy, specifically those benefits and dangers of having a single dominant cash crop. Berkeley, for his part, recognized the dangers of having only a single crop that the economy was based on and did make attempts to diversify that economy but always fell short as tobacco would continue to reign supreme. More distressingly for the future of the colony was the increasing amount of social stratification occurring in Virginia. Three groups would emerge in the colony. The first group, and the group calling the shots, was the large landowners. The second group was made up of poor farmers, with the final group being the indentured servants and the slaves. Though slavery itself would become far more common following the rebellion, largely as a result of that rebellion. And if you have noticed that we've not really talked a whole lot about slavery this season, it's for that very reason. We are going to talk much more about it next season. Internally, the colony was becoming increasingly divided, while at the same time, a series of events outside of the control of the colony would further drive up tensions. First, England wanted to attempt to reap more money from the colonial trade and pass the much-hated Navigation Acts. The Navigation Acts flagged certain exports, which they placed a lot of additional controls over, thus making trade more limited. For example, trade between the colony and anybody else became prohibited, 
Virginia could not trade tobacco to France directly, for instance. Rather, they would have to send their product to England, who then could conduct the trade with France themselves. The effect of this is that suddenly England was flooded with tobacco, because now all roads for tobacco had to lead through England itself. As the supply rapidly boomed internally in England, the price of tobacco was forced down. Virginia not being allowed to trade with anywhere else, likewise only had a single merchant they could sell with. This means that the price was further driven down because with nobody else to sell the product to, the Virginians found themselves being further lowballed by the English. All of the dangers of having a single cash crop were now quickly being put on display, far too late in the game to do anything about it. With nothing else really to bolster the economy, the downturn in tobacco led to an economic depression. As though this was not bad enough, rising amounts of cronyism in Virginia would pour gasoline on what was now a smoldering fire. William Berkeley really cannot be blamed for the navigation acts, as those are well above his pay grade. Plus, Berkeley had made attempts to diversify the economy in order to avoid this exact situation. Despite those efforts, however, Berkeley did a whole lot to make matters in Virginia that much worse. Rampant overtaxation by Berkeley further strained a colony that was in the midst of an economic downturn due to those navigation acts. The extra tax revenue was at least in part issued, not just to raise funds, but rather it was designed as a method to maintain the status quo on the government. This includes raising tax dollars in order to buy out proprietors coming to Virginia, whom Berkeley worried would challenge his position in the government. And just to make matters a little bit worse, that tax was actually completely unnecessary as the Duke of York had already gone ahead and voided those land grants the year before. If this and other taxes were not enough on their own, the colony was being terribly mismanaged at the same time. The money that was being raised oftentimes was not making it back to England as the colonists expected, but rather was lining the pockets of Berkeley and his other friends in the assembly. At the peak of this period of overtaxation, it is estimated that farmers were paying roughly half their yearly income in taxes. A final cherry on top of the issue of overtaxation came from the fact that Berkeley and the assembly were immune from paying the much-hated taxes themselves. This means that those who could least afford it were the ones required to fund the colony, while the largest and richest landholders paid nothing. All of these problems in Virginia had Berkeley in a tight spot. However, if overtaxation and corruption were the things that set the stage for the revolt, it was the mishandling of Indian affairs that would ultimately blow everything up. Things began going south following a member of the Doag Indian tribe killing a colonist over a dispute regarding a stolen hog. In response to this, Berkeley sent out men to intercept the guilty parties. However, following a handful of bungled missions led by great-grandfathers of founding fathers, chiefly George Mason and John Washington, suddenly the Virginia colony was now looking at a full-scale Indian war. Berkeley, already standing on thin ice and looking down the very real threat of a tax rebellion, would not help out his own cause. By this point, the colonists along the frontier were scared and angry. Englishmen were dead. However, rather than launch into an aggressive war, Berkeley instead set out on a largely defensive plan. Berkeley denounced the actions of Mason and Washington. With Indian hostilities rising, the plan Berkeley went with was to order a series of forts to be built. These forts, which were largely built on the land owned by those large landholders, also meant a chance to increase taxes on everybody else. In one swift move, Berkeley had managed to convey to the colonists that he was unconcerned about their plight. On top of that, though, he was going to levy a new tax against them when they were already being pushed to the breaking point. Finally, the money that they were going to now have to pay was going to be funneled directly into the hands of the large landholders who were already exempted from tax burdens. The whole thing stank of corruption and the colonists had finally had enough. Led by the 29-year-old gentleman Nathaniel Bacon, an expedition set out to deal with the Indian problem. The issue is that this expedition was not sanctioned by either the Assembly or William Berkeley. With anger mounting, men quickly flocked over to Bacon's cause, and in short order he had a sizable force at his disposal. What followed was a slaughter of members of the Okanichi tribe. In the eyes of the scared colonists, Bacon was victorious 
against the evil Berkeley who was unwilling to help them. Bacon's Rebellion, however, is not the story about a war with the Indians, but rather was a fight against the Virginia government itself. Bacon suddenly found himself becoming extremely popular, as he had led the expedition and conducted warfare without the express permission of the Virginia government. Bacon now was a serious risk to that very government, and especially to William Berkeley personally. Berkeley issued a largely ignored order for everybody to stand down, before he declared that Bacon was a traitor. In the ensuing popular wave, the now fugitive Bacon found himself being elected to the assembly. Not wanting to miss the opportunity, Bacon made his way to the then-colonial capital in Jamestown. Following a brief skirmish where Berkeley's forces fired at him, Bacon and 40 men landed near Jamestown. After a short while, Bacon decided that staying in Jamestown was probably too dangerous and attempted to get back out. However, during his escape, he was captured. Berkeley, however, appearing to have learned his lesson, wanted little more than a promise from Bacon that he was not going to, you know, try to overthrow the government again. A promise which Bacon readily made in the interest of saving his life. If this seems like an odd move, and certainly everybody thought this was an odd move, it is because Berkeley was aware that Bacon had militia forces gathering just outside of Jamestown. Berkeley's sudden about-face did have the desired effect, however, of getting the militia to back down and head back home. Which, of course, as soon as they did, Berkeley put a warrant out on Bacon and went to arrest him yet again. The problem for Berkeley is that Bacon was not where he was expected to be. Bacon's militia quickly got word of the betrayal, turned around, and made their way right back to Jamestown. Berkeley at this point realized that he had made a big miscalculation, and that it was time for him to get out of Dodge. Unfortunately for Berkeley, time was not on his side, and the angry mob reached Virginia before he could get himself on a ship back to London. Badly outnumbered on June 23rd, Bacon took Jamestown unopposed. Berkeley, when confronted with the now in control Bacon, challenged him to a sword fight before marching off. While Bacon undoubtedly would have loved to remove Berkeley, he still could not do that. Attacking a royal governor was the kind of thing that might get London involved, which was something that he had very little interest in doing. Likewise, Bacon still did have an Indian problem that he needed to deal with. After all, this was his entire justification for leading a militia in the first place. This absence gave Berkeley time to regroup. What followed was months of Bacon gaining ground in men while William Berkeley, despite a real talent for ineptitude, just kept surviving. Seriously. Time and time again, it looks like Berkeley is done. However, he just keeps staging incredible comebacks, despite the fact that the guy had very little support. By September of 1667, Berkeley had managed to raise a meager force of men still willing to fight for him and move back to take Jamestown. With the battle beginning on September 13th, within the day, Jamestown was under siege from the Baconian forces. Berkeley made a final stand and attempted to swing things in his favor with a single decisive attack. Unfortunately for Berkeley, not only did this fail, but it failed spectacularly. Now dangerously exposed, Bacon and his men moved in once again to capture Jamestown. With Jamestown having become the picture of corruption under Berkeley during the invasion, the town began to burn. By the end of September 20th, the original English colony was gone. Virtually everything was destroyed. Berkeley did manage to escape, however, once again he found himself with virtually zero support. Right at the pinnacle of his power, and with at least murmurings of Chesapeake independence going around private circles in Bacon's camp, Bacon would go ahead and derail everything. On October 26, 1667, Nathaniel Bacon unexpectedly died from dysentery. While the rebellion would continue on, the spark had been extinguished. In February of 1677, English troops began pouring into Virginia to take control over the situation. Berkeley, who seemingly survived all of this, would suddenly find himself to be on the outside of a new order. There were no plans to restore him to power. Berkeley would spend a few more miserable months in Virginia, where he was really nothing more than a thorn in the side of the British troops, before he would be stuck on a boat back to London in May 1677. Just two months later, William Berkeley himself died. The end of Bacon's Rebellion brought a strange new reality to Virginia. 
Sure, the large landholders and the small planters had just fought a war with each other. But now they had something in common. They all despised the English occupation. Suddenly, these two sides that had been so opposed to each other were quickly becoming allies in an effort to get rid of the British troops and get life back to normal. At the same time, events during the rebellion really worried both sides about having such a large population of indentured servants. Popular opinion in Virginia began to shift as everybody began believing that slave populations would be easier to control. We see in the decades following the rebellion, therefore, a rapidly rising population of Virginian slaves as the number of indentured servants would begin to decline. If overthrow and internal corruption was the name of the game in Virginia during the season, in New England, colonists largely ignored London entirely. Time and time again, London would become concerned over events in New England. However, nearly every single time, events at home would distract them from their wayward colonies. Following the execution of the Boston Martyrs, those Quakers in Massachusetts, including Mary Dyer, London had decided to keep a closer eye on Massachusetts. This isn't to say, however, that anything they were doing was really working particularly well at reining in what was quickly becoming viewed as a dangerously independent colony. Well, tensions with England would be an underlying theme for the better part of the next 25 years, internal problems began to arise as well. Possibly no bigger issue existed in Massachusetts and likewise throughout the rest of New England as the war that would grip the colony beginning in 1675. Between the English and the North Americans, there had been peace in New England since the end of the Pequot War during the 1630s. However, that would all be thrown on its head when the events of King Philip's War began in Plymouth. Now, we spent a lot of time during our first season setting up the often tense friendship between Massasoit and the Plymouth colonists. Following the death of Massasoit, power would end up passing to one of his sons, Metacom. Metacom took the English name Philip. The events that led to the war begin during January of 1675, when John Sassaman, an Englishman living amongst the native tribes, came and warned the Plymouth colonies that Philip was preparing for war. This was unquestionably a concern in Plymouth. There had been tensions before with Philip, and concerns of war had not even been that far from the minds of the colonists. What really differentiated the situation, however, from previous ones, is what came next. Chiefly, after being sent on his way, John Sassaman was found dead. Not only was he dead, but it was obvious that he had been murdered. The assailants had done what they could to make his death look like an accident, which absolutely nobody believed that it was. It was very clear to everybody that Sassaman had been silenced by somebody. Sassaman's killers were identified as three of Philip's advisors. They were promptly put on trial for murder, convicted, and sentenced to death. Despite attempts by colonial governor Josiah Winslow to make this appear as fair as possible, Philip was not having any of it. Just 12 days after the executions took place, hostilities opened up at Swansea. What would follow over the course of the next year was an absolutely devastating war that would sweep through all of New England. Despite superior weapons and technology, there was nothing easy about this war. The English were dying in numbers far higher than expected. The strategy being employed by Philip was not one of open engagements, something that he surely knew that the English would have been favored in. Rather, what emerged was a type of quick hit-and-run style attack. Most of the time, the English would find themselves caught off guard and then scrambling to respond to the most recent aggression. By the time that they were able to actually mount any kind of a defense, the Indian tribes would have gone right back into the woods and disappeared. King Philip's War was unique for several reasons. First, this is a war that was fought between not just Plymouth and the Wampanoag, but rather was a complete regional conflict. The war spread beyond the borders of Plymouth and soon all of the New England colonies found themselves fighting. Now, interestingly enough, despite the war being named King Philip's War, the fact remains that he is far from being the only leader. What emerged during King Philip's War was a conflict that was primarily fought by the Native American tribes over English encroachment onto their lands. King Philip oftentimes does not appear to be in control of the greater Indian war machine. The war also shows up as a bungled disaster by the English. Over and over again, the English would walk into negotiations with other tribes, trying to woo them over to their cause and just completely mess up the entire thing. Nowhere does this become more clear than in looking at their dealing with the powerful Narragansett tribe. 
The first contact was made by Edward Hutchinson, the son of the late Anne Hutchinson. The Narragansett tribe seemed to be a natural ally of the English. Both sides hated Philip and would have been glad to see him dead. The mistake, however, is that Hutchinson walked in and demanded the alliance, demanded that the Narragansett hand over hostages, and reminded them that anything short of full cooperation would see them labeled as enemies. Well, both sides shared similar objectives, the English approach was so heavy-handed that it gave little flexibility for the Narragansett and forced them into the war on the other side. This episode so perfectly shows the failure of the colonists to act with any meaningful amount of cohesion and help explains why they seem to be playing catch-up literally until the very end of the war. For the most part, the Indian strategy of quick hit-and-run attacks proved to be very successful. These attacks will continue throughout the spring of 1676, with only a handful of engagements between the two sides. At the end of 1675, the Great Swamp Fight took place, which gives a good example of what happened when there was direct fighting, rather than these hit-and-run style attacks. During that battle, once the English claimed a victory, somewhere around 200 Narragansett were killed to roughly 100 Englishmen. Well, the Indian forces caused substantial damage and havoc throughout 1675. By the time that 1676 rolled around, their limitations were quickly beginning to show. Ultimately, the English were always going to win the war. They had better weapons, they had better armor, and they had a good number of men willing to fight. Part of the problem for Philip, and hence the Indians, is that the alliances that they had formed were weak at best. Well, the English certainly did their best to bumble their way to victory they were always going to get there. The Wampanoag and the Narragansetts, for instance, were not friends. They were far from it. The alliance between them existed out of absolute necessity over having a common enemy, not out of any ideological connection or genuine friendship. This means that when things started to go bad, the alliances that Philip had quickly broke down. Throughout the late spring and summer of 1676, as Indian losses begin to amass, we see those loose alliances begin to increasingly fracture. Following a devastating loss in Hadley, Massachusetts in June, the English realized that they had their enemy on the ropes. Rather than a military attack, the English responded with an act of mercy. The New Englanders offered widespread pardons for Indian tribes who had participated in the war. Several tribes, now seeing the writing on the wall, jumped at this deal, further eroding Philip's now collapsing army. The events in Hadley combined with the Proclamation of Mercy essentially ended all major operations of the war. From that point forward, the English were on a mop-up mission. In August of 1676, the English would score their biggest victory yet in the war when they got good information as to where Philip himself was going to be. In the early morning hours of August 12th, near Bristol, Rhode Island, Philip himself was shot and killed. Though major operations in the war were now at a close, Officially, the war is going to drag on until 1678 when Edmund Andros would have to come in and mediate a conclusion to the conflict. The aftermath and legacy of King Philip's War is going to absolutely transform the next decade and a half for Massachusetts, and the rest of New England as a whole. The colonists had won the war, however the cost had been staggering. At least a thousand colonists had died. Towns all throughout the region had been burned and destroyed. The economy was in tatters. Back in London, concern was not over the outcome of the war, but rather the fact that one offered help, specifically from Andros who was in New York, that help was turned away at gunpoint. This was another troubling sign that New England had become dangerously independent. For the Puritans in New England, they took the events of King Philip's War as being a sign that they had moved too far away from God. The war was punishment for their sins. Once again, the eyes of the crown were focused on New England and what the colonists were doing over there. Charles II recognized the necessity to regain control of the increasingly insolent colony. As we have just spent several weeks discussing, the response from New England was mixed as to these maneuvers by Charles II. Largely, the colonists would either outright ignore the royal orders or otherwise just do their best to dance around them. The king, for his part, found the later part of the 1670s and early part of the 1680s a tumultuous time back at home. Following the popish plot, an anti-Catholic wave swept through England, much to the chagrin of the king's brother, 
and then Duke of York, James. James was an open Catholic and did nothing to hide his religious beliefs. This, combined with the suspicion caused by the Popish plot, leads to the exclusion crisis, where members of Parliament wanted to skip over James to his Anglican daughter Mary. Though the crown would ultimately win at quashing the crisis and ensuring that James would take the throne upon his brother's death, back in New England, the damage was considerable. The crown had just survived a serious threat from Parliament to its royal prerogative. Suddenly, the name of the game in England became re-establishing their power throughout the entire English dominion, including finally getting control over New England. Though Charles II would die before his plans were complete, his newly elevated brother James II planned to continue on in that path. The Massachusetts Charter was revoked and New England was combined into a single government. After a brief time under the leadership of Joseph Dudley, the power would quickly pass to former governor of New York and longtime supporter of James II and House Steward in general, Edmund Andros. Andros initially was not without some support in the colony. Initially, we see two groups emerge, the faction which was made up of the old Puritan ruling elites and the moderates largely made up of the merchant class. The moderates supported the revocation of the Massachusetts Charter and they were anxious to see the breakup of Puritan hegemony, not just through Massachusetts, but all of New England. The problem is that Andros proved to be deeply unpopular amongst pretty much everybody. His actions meant substantially higher taxes. Reorganization of the lands put many in danger of losing their land. His strict enforcement of the Navigation Acts was likewise devastating to an economy that was still trying to overcome the damage from King Philip's War. Andros likewise made clear that while he did have a committee to advise him, advice was really their only role. This was not an assembly that had any real power. If Andros wanted to act unilaterally, that is exactly what he was going to do. Even the moderates who had supported the revocation of the Massachusetts Charter in the first place were just as isolated and hurt from Andros as the Puritans who had formerly been in charge. Even those who were on Andros's own council found themselves frustrated by the actions of Andros. This created a situation where, for Andros, outside of his most ardent followers, nobody really supported him. He was a deeply unpopular figure who had largely completely isolated himself. Even amongst those on his council, Andros remained exceedingly unpopular. Following James II's increasingly pro-Catholic and anti anglican moves inside of England, many were becoming concerned. However, at the end of the day, it's not like James II had a son, so following his death, the crown would pass to his Anglican daughter Mary. Mary's husband was from the Netherlands, William of Orange, and he is about to be thrust onto the stage in a very big way. Well, initially, James II posed a limited threat, as upon his death, the crown would pass to his Anglican daughter Mary, thus limiting the risk of a Catholic dynasty. However, this all went out the window in June of 1688 when he announced that the queen was pregnant and they promptly had a son. Suddenly, that limited threat was gone and the threat of a Catholic dynasty was now impossible to ignore. Needing to act, members of parliament turned to William of Orange for his help, asking him if he was interested in the job of being the King of England. William was indeed interested and in the fall of 1688, William invaded England. Upon witnessing mass defections to the invading William, James quickly realized that the gig was up and did what he could to both avoid mass loss of life and probably did his best to avoid the fate of his father, Charles I. When the news of the Glorious Revolution hit Massachusetts, colonists quickly realized that they had a small opening. Acting under the example of their brethren in England, an angry mob quickly organized in Boston on April 18, 1689. Throughout the 18th, the mob continued to swell as members of Andros' own government were taken into custody. By the end of the day, Edmund Andros himself was in custody and the Dominion of New England, which had been the power for the past four years, had collapsed. What was left in the ashes of the Old Dominion was the question of what do we do next? The New England colonies had to quickly decide just how to proceed without the Dominion's government. Most colonies just returned to where they were prior to the Dominion taking over and began trying to justify what exactly had just happened. Meanwhile, over in New York, a relative latecomer to the Dominion, it was a militia captain by the name of Jacob Leisler who had seized the government in that colony. 
Weisler would remain the governor until 1691, when he himself would be marched to the gallows and hung for treason. The second half of the 17th century was, without any question, a time of change in the colonies. Rebellions and warfare had swept through from Virginia to Maine. The events of these 25 years is going to have a major impact on the generations to follow as well. It will help reframe the question in the colonies that would begin to reign supreme in the decades to come. Chiefly, what is the role of the North American English colonies in the greater English empire? Next time, we are going to return and look back at the events that we saw this season and try to make sense of all of it. What did this all mean, and what would it mean for the future United States moving forward? With that, I hope you are staying healthy and staying safe, and I will see you back here in two weeks' time, where we are going to try to figure out what this has all meant and bring an end to our second season.